Blake? Uh, do you mind going a little bit back to 9.1? Not at all. Number 11. Just grab the question here so we can all look at it at the same time. <clears throat> Oh, yuck, I asked you to do this? It says sketch the direction field. Oh, that's 9-2. Phew. I was going to say, I'm like, that's embarrassing. I shouldn't have asked you to do that. That's like way too much of a hassle. Okay, this seems more reasonable. Okay, so it says explain why the functions with the given graphs can't be solutions to the differential equation dy dt equals e to the t quantity y minus 1 squared. So first things first, I would notice that the derivative is going to equal 0 when y is equal to 1, right? Everybody agree with that? If I plug 1 in for y, I get 1 minus 1, which is 0. 0 times anything is 0. So I'd expect to see a, or, or, uh, the graph to be flat, where y is equal to 1. Maybe it's there. Definitely not here, though. So this one is, b is certainly ridiculous, because it doesn't have uh, an equilibrium you know, a slope is zero. It doesn't have an equilibrium point at uh, y equals one. Now let's look at this one here. Um, so e to the t is always positive, right? For all values of t. Everybody agree with that? Since it's an exponential. y minus one squared is always going to be positive as well. So the slope should always be positive. So this little section here where the slope is negative, it's decreasing, I know is can't happen. So that would be my explanation for part A. Notice in part B, the graph is increasing the whole way. So that's not a problem, but it doesn't have that equilibrium value where y is equal to 1, giving us slope 0. Does that feel okay, Blake? So again, not much to do mathematics-wise. You just had to like know what you're looking at and go, okay, well, let me look at this. What can I say about this thing? And I just said, okay, well, there needs to be an equilibrium. And this one doesn't have it. This one might. Looks like it's close enough to call it. Um, and then I go, okay, well, what else is, can I say about this thing? It's like, well, it's always positive. And then clearly this one, we have a piece there where the slope is negative. So. Who's next? Mia. Nine point one number five? Sure. Okay. So this says uh, which of the following are solutions of the differential equation y double prime plus y is equal to sine x. Well, basically what I'm going to do is I'm just going to be doing um, checking second derivatives, right? Because I know that if I know the second derivative, 
I can plug it into the formula and see if it checks out if it equals sine x. So if I do part A, the first derivative of sine is cosine, and the second derivative of cosine is negative sine. So here, y prime plus y is going to equal 0. So that doesn't work. That's not a solution. If I do part b, the derivative of cosine is negative sine, and the derivative of negative sine is negative cosine. So here, y prime plus y is equal to negative cosine plus cosine. That's that didn't work. Part C, uh, the first derivative of 1 half sine x, well that's a product rule problem, right? So I have 1 half sine x plus 1 half x cosine x, and then the second derivative of that is going to be 1 half cosine x, and I have another chain rule, so I have 1 half cosine x plus 1 half x negative sine x. So y double prime plus y is going to be cosine x and then I have, uh, let's write it that way, we have x sine x, or one half, x sine x, that's y, and I have plus cosine x minus one half sine x. So that's going to equal cosine, that's still not what we want. Guess what the last one's going to do though? That one's going to work. So one half uh, or negative one half cosine x sine x. So the first derivative is one half. Uh, oops, negative one half cosine x uh, plus one half x sine x. And the second derivative for that is going to be um, 1 half sine x plus 1 half sine x min or plus 1 half cosine oops, x cosine x. So y prime plus y is going to be sine x or plus one half x cosine x and then y is negative one half x cosine x and those cancel out and I'm left with just x or sine x which is what we needed to have happen. So it's just like do some second derivatives and then just kind of plug it into the formula and see if it gives us sine x. Blake? Sorry, I don't know why, but I got lost on this last part. So what exactly did you plug in? So the question has that the differential equation y double prime plus y is equal to sine x. So I plugged in my y double prime, which is this, okay. plus y, oh, yeah, which okay. was this, yep. okay. and just tried to see if I got sine x to come back out of it. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. So I was just kind of guess and checking it, basically. Yeah. Feel good? Yeah. Good. Mia, are you happy with that? Yeah, not too bad, right? That's good. Should have felt okay. It was a little tedious or whatever, but just doing derivatives. That's first semester stuff. I'm still pretty good at that.
Anybody else? Blake? You do for 9.2 and then the 19 C. Sure. 9 2, 19 C. Got a lot of words here. All right. Use Euler's method, which with each of the following step sizes to estimate the value of y of 0.4, where y is the solution of the initial value problem. Y prime equals y, where y of 0 is equal to 1. Hey, do you know that differential, that solution right there? Yeah, e to the t or whatever, e to the x would be our solution. I can tell right away by looking at it. It's the only one where the derivative is itself. Uh, okay, and you said you had it. That was okay. You did that. Um, part B, it says we know that the exact solution of the initial value problem, oh, if part A is y equals e to the x. Good job, Mr. Kulik. Uh, draw as accurately as you can the graph of e to the x between 0 and 0.4 together with our approximations from part A, okay, use your sketches to decide whether your estimates are part A are under or over estimates. Okay, you said you that was okay. Uh, the error in Euler's method is the difference between the exact value and the approximate value. Find the errors made in part A using Euler's method to estimate the true value of y of 0.4, namely e to the 0.4. What happens to each error each time the step size is halved? So all we're doing is we're just taking, oops, for c, you're taking e to the 0.4, and you're subtracting from it our answer for like a1, a part one, and then a part two, and then a part three. And I'm guessing that if we look at these three numbers, like I divide by two to go to this one, divide by two to go to this one, would be my suspicion as to what's happening. Is it the errors having every time the step size is halved? But I don't know. I don't have the numbers for the first part. Yeah, that's, that's okay. I can do this on my own. I, I did that, that helps. There. Just kind of deciphering what is what are they yeah. asking me to do here? Yeah, they think that ought to do it. Let's just since I got. We did the problem. Let's just double check and make sure that uh, yeah, that's that should be the observation. So this number should have been like one point four. This one was 144, and this one was uh, 146.41. Yeah. Yeah. So as you do that subtraction, you should be getting the area you should be getting should be about halving each time. Again, so it'll be approximately. Okay. But that that would be the observation that you're looking for. Does that feel okay? Good, 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 good. All righty, should we do nine three? I think this is the um, probably the the most involved section in this chapter. So this is the one that I think really kind of ties everything together. 
So what we've been doing up until this point has been like, okay, if I have a solution, I can check to make sure that it works by like taking, doing some derivatives and plugging it back into the differential equation, making sure it checks out like we did in 9.1. In 9.2, if I have a differential equation and an initial condition, I can kind of sketch in a graph for that by creating a direction field, right? In part three, we're gonna do these, do this now algebraically. So we're going to try to generate our solution for our differential equation by using calculus, symbolic calculus. No graphs, no initial conditions, no slope, or well, we'll have initial conditions, but we're, no slope fields, no like, okay, here's the equation, here's your answer, just check it out. It's gonna be actually generating these solutions. And we're not going to be looking at every possible differential equation that you could solve. That would be like multiple graduate level courses in like calculus doing this. We're just going to look at some simple situations. Um, the simple situation we're going to be talking about is a separable equation. So a separable differential equation is a first order differential equation where that dy dx can be factored as a function of x times a function of y. So basically we need something where dy dx is gonna equal some f of x times some g of y. If that's the case, I can move the y variables to one side. So I'd have one over g of y times dy. And then I can multiply dx to both sides. So I'd have equals f of x dx. That gives me all the x variables on one side as well as the differential and all the y variables on the other side along with its differential. Now that the variables have been separated, I can integrate on the left with respect to y and I can integrate on the right with respect to x. So let's go through and do some examples here. So here we have the differential equation dy dx equals x squared over y squared. So again, I notice that this is really a function of x, x squared times a function of y, 1 over y squared. Everybody feel okay with how we can visualize that? Okay, we'll separate both equations. So on the right, or we'll multiply both sides by y squared, and then multiply both sides by dx. That'll separate the variables, getting the y's on one side and the x's on the other. Is everybody okay with how we did that? So now we can integrate both sides. The antiderivative of y cubed or y squared is y cubed over 3. And the integral of x squared is x cubed over 3. Yeah, very good. So John says, what about a plus c? We absolutely need one because these are indefinite integrals. Do I put a plus C on both sides? Do I put it on one side or the other? What do I do? Yeah, so why can I just put it on one side? Yeah, so like I could think about like plus C1 over here, plus C over there, C2 over there, and I can subtract the C1 over to the other side, and C2 minus C1 is just another constant. So we'll just put it just on one side and just call it cap C. Everybody's okay with that? So technically, each of these integrations result in a constant, but I can just move all the constants to one side and just call it some other constant. Just a little hand wavy. All right. 
That's great. That's our solution for part A. No big deal, right? That was pretty easy. Part B says uh, to find the solution that satisfies the initial condition, y of 0 is equal to 2. So what does that mean? That means I'm going to plug 2 in for y. and 0 in for x to solve for c. So my this specific solution would be y cubed equals x cubed over 3 plus 8 thirds. And that would be fine. Although, is this probably the way that we'd leave it? Probably not, right? Well, how do we usually like to leave this? Just like a y equals, right? So multiply both sides by 3. And then do the cube root of both sides. And I bet this would be the answer that would be in the back of the textbook. Although the answer that we gave before is fine. It's correct. There's nothing wrong with it. Unless the directions say, like, write your solution in terms, you know, as a, in y in terms of x or something. As a function of y in terms of x. You know what I mean? It would be just a directions issue at that point. But that should be okay. That's not bad, right? No big deal. Feels very much like stuff we've done before. Let's do another. How's this one looking? dy dx equals 6x squared over 2y plus cosine y. Looks good, right? That's in the proper form. So I multiply both sides by 2y plus cosine y and both sides by dx. So everything is separated. We can integrate both sides now. So on the left, because this is addition, I can just integrate each chunk separately. So the antiderivative of 2y is y squared. And the antiderivative of cosine x or cosine y is, I should say, sine y. And the antiderivative of 6x is over 2. Oh, 6x squared. Thank you. Yep. So what's the antiderivative of 6x squared? 2x cubed. And then we still need a plus c at the end of that. Notice that since we weren't given an initial condition, the solution is this, with just a plus c, right? So just to get a visual, this is weird. This is going to be a weird one, right? What the heck is this going to look like? So like one possible solution might look like this, if I add some more, you know, but that C is a constant, it could be whatever, so it's going to, you know, there's a bunch of different solutions. 
easy for me to graph this with this Graphmatica program, less easy to get this picture on your calculator, right? It'd be an unholy nightmare. Uh, well, what I, what I would do is I would just swap the X's and Y's and I would graph it as like, pretend like the Y's are my X's on my calculator and just hold my calculator sideways or whatever is how I, how I would try to do that. But that's the best you could do with it, which is not a super obvious trick. Like you're probably a math teacher if you're like, oh, we'll just call the X's, Y's, and the Y's, X's, and just hold the calculator sideways and it'll be fine, right? Like, woof. Um, but that wasn't bad, right? Still, no big deal. All right, uh, let's do one more here. Okay. So y prime is equal to x squared y. What am I going to do with this? Well, first I would rewrite it, right? Y prime is the same thing as dy dx. Everybody okay there? Like not an obvious first step, but kind of a necessary one, right? And now we'll divide by y. I'm going to write it that way. Is that okay with you guys? It's okay to write it as 1 over y. You don't really get any advantage out of it. It just by doing it this way, just a little neater for me, I guess. So far, so good. Integrate both sides. And what's the antiderivative of y to the negative 1, or 1 over y? Natural log of absolute value y. I know, you guys love to forget the absolute value on that. It's okay. And the antiderivative of x squared, well, that's easy. So that part's done, right? What if, though, we wanted to write this in terms of y? So like the y by itself. What would I need to do to get the y by itself? Good, we'd have to use the exponent base e to both sides, right? Okay, and then how do I get rid of the uh, absolute value? You said it really quietly, I couldn't really hear. We won't do it greater than or less then. So what if I have the absolute value of x is equal to two? <coughs> there you go, yeah, exactly right. Sometimes it's one of those that, like, the answer is very simple if you make the problem simple. Everybody's okay with this? There's one additional algebra step that I almost a guarantee that the back of the textbook would do to represent this answer. And it's going to have to do with that plus C. If we have something added in the exponent, what's that the same as? Just adding it outside the exponent. Not adding. 
multiplies e to the c, right? Because when I have two things with the same base, we add their exponents, right? So if I have something added in the exponent, that was the result of some multiplication of two things with the same base. And here we'll probably just call e to the c just like a c since that's just a constant. That would probably be what your final answer would look like if you check this in the back of the book. Everybody's okay with that? And that's like what we're doing in this section. So there's the homework for this section. It's pretty quick. That's not bad though, right? Because um, I would like to take a minute here and talk about a little bit of 7.4. So this is another kind of like standard calc 1-2 topic that is not part of the AB exam, but I think is like, this is something you would see in a Calc 1 or 2 course, so I'd like to, I'd like to do it because I think it would be good for you guys. Um, much in the same way we're doing integration by parts, even though that's not part of the AB, but that's 100% something you would do in your Calc 1-2 class. So 7-4 is about integrating a rational function using a technique called partial fractions. So suppose that we wanted to integrate something like x plus 5 over x squared plus x minus 2. So before when we had a rational function like this, we saw there were a couple of situations we could deal with. One was we could do this like completing the square thing, and maybe we could cram that into like a tangent inverse or a sine inverse antiderivative rule with a little bit of u sub. That's not always going to be the case, though, because here, notice the numerator has a variable in it also. So that's going to be a problem for us. Really, the only things that we can integrate if they can't be shoved into those tan inverse or sine inverse antiderivative rules are things that are like constant over linear polynomial. Those situations we can just do u sub with the uh, 1 over x antiderivative rule and take care of it. So what we're searching for is a process that can go from something like this and take us back to something like that. So we're looking for a process to go backwards, so breaking apart the addition of two fractions. So I want to take one fraction and be able to write it as the sum of two different fractions. That's the process that we're going to look for here. That will allow us then to integrate that should be easy to do. The question is, how do I do that process of taking the addition of two fractions and going backwards from the sum? So that's what we're going to be doing. So this process is called partial fraction decomposition. And the way this is going to work is we are going to start by factoring the denominator so how does x squared plus x minus 2 factor x plus 2 times x minus 1 and I know that must have been the result of like something over x plus 2 plus something else over x minus 1.
Everybody okay with that? So if I take this equation and I multiply both sides of this by that common or that uh, least common denominator, I end up with x plus 5 equals a times x minus 1 plus b times x plus 2. And if I distribute through my a's and b's, I have a plus b times x minus a plus 2b. Yep. And then I just, because they both, I had ax plus bx, so I just wrote it as like a plus bx, right? So what I have now to solve for A and B is I really have a system of equations. I have that the coefficient A plus B has to equal 1. And I have that negative A plus 2B has to equal 5. What's going to be the fastest way to solve that system? Yeah, I'm going to use a matrix to do that. So I'm just going to use the RREF. Does everybody remember how to set this up on their calculator? We're good. If you're not, I can give more details, but if we everybody still kind of remembers how to do this, I will just uh, kind of talk through this because it should be something that we remember. We did it a fair bit Achoo! in our background. Okay, so that tells me A is negative 1 and B is 2. So I can say that x plus 5 over x squared plus x minus 2 is equal to uh, negative 1 over x plus 2 plus 2 over x minus 1. That's my partial fraction decomposition, which coincidentally, if we go back and look at what happened up here, is exactly what we saw there, right? Negative 1 and 2. Okay. Um, so I'm going to skip some of these examples because I don't want to spend like a million years doing this. Um, well, maybe we should do, let's do one more. Right, so you can see it all together. So let's do this one. Wait a minute, why am I doing this one? We don't need any help doing this, right? Do you need to do partial fraction decomposition to do this? No, what can we do? Polynomial division, exactly, yes, 100%. You could just use polynomial division on that one. How do I know I can do that? the degree of the numerator is bigger than the degree of the denominator. Even if they're equal, I should be able to do polynomial division and make it a little better for myself. Um, here, though, what should I do here? Yeah, this one we're going to need to do that, right? So my first step would be to factor the denominator. It's 
So when I do that, I get X and then multiplies to give me, well, I just kind of guess and check it, right? This is should be pretty easy to just guess and check. Um, since I know I'm gonna have like a two and a one as my constant. So I think I'm gonna need a 2x and that's got to be plus and then this is to be minus. So I just guess and check that because there was like really a limited set of ways that could be configured. Right, because I get 4x here and then minus 1 gives me the 3x in the middle. Okay. So when I set this up, I'm going to need three fractions, right? One for each of the denominator or parts of my denominator. Everybody's okay there with what I did? Just basically did that same clear fraction thing. If I'm going too fast or if I skip too many steps, say something and we can go and fill in some blanks. But this is like kind of algebra 2 y kind of stuff here, right? Just dealing with rational equation, rational function. Okay. So go ahead and multiply the right-hand sides out. So that's going to be 2, well, let's write it this way, a times 2x squared plus 3x minus 2 plus b times 2x squared minus x plus c times x squared plus 2x. So I'm going to write myself a system now. I'm going to do one equation for my x squared. So I'm going to have 2a plus 2b plus 1c has to equal 1. And then I'll write a equation for my x coefficients. So I'm going to have 3a plus negative 1b plus 2c has to equal 2. And then I'll write an equation for my constants. Everybody's okay here? So this I need a three by four. Two, two, one, one. Three, negative one, two, two. Negative 2, 0, 0, negative 1. So I get A is a half, B is a negative 1 tenth, and C is 1 fifth. OK. 
Okay, so that's the partial fraction decomposition there. So now we're ready to integrate. So we're going to be integrating uh, negative one half over x plus negative one tenth over x plus two and then one fifth over two x minus one. So go ahead and just rewrite this a little bit. So the first integral Very easy, right? To do the second integral, we have to do a u sub, but it's a very easy u sub. So it doesn't really, it's like a nothing burger of a u sub there. But this last one, I pick up an extra one half there. And there we go. Does that feel okay? All right. Um, what if uh, we have something here? So what if we were doing something like this and we get repeated linear factors? So Notice here that I could do is polynomial division. I'm going to save us all the aggravation of writing that all out and just write down what that polynomial division is. We'll get there about what the repeating linear factor is. Sorry, I I was, That's okay. Like nope. Nope. We have not. And now I'm going to factor the denominator. So I would do this by grouping, right? And then that's a difference of two squares. So we have a repeated linear factor. Do you, me to, you factor that? Do you, mean, do, you, do you mean me to write it like this and then put them together? You're looking at me funny. 
No, but like, how did you back that the, denominator? I did it by grouping. Oh. So I took an x squared out of the first group and a negative one out of the second group. That gives me the x squared minus one. Both of them are x minus. Both the stuff left in are x minus one, so that pulls out. No? Do we need to do it? We can, we can do it. It's okay. It's not a big deal. This is the last example I think we want to do in here. Um, so make my two groups. From the first group I can take out an x squared. From the second group I can take out a negative 1. Because both the x minus 1 is common, I can factor that out, leaving x squared minus 1. And then I notice x squared minus 1 is a difference of two squares. Oh, and, it is? Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, yeah, it's one. yeah, 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 okay. Which gives me that. Okay. okay. So when I talk about a repeated linear factor, x minus 1 is a repeated linear factor, because there's two of them in this factor. Factor it, right? Okay, so integrating this part, no problem. Integrating this, we have to do that partial fraction decomposition. So I'm going to ignore the x plus 1 for a little bit, and we'll come back to it. Everybody's okay with that? I'm just going to pretend it, does, it went away for a minute. That's going to be some x minus 1 or x squared. But I also need an x minus 1 to the first. So this does is going to also have three distinct fractions. Now it's possible that either a or b could be a 0, but I don't know that from jump. I have to assume that I could have had an x minus 1 squared and an x minus 1 to the first. Either way, when I add these three fractions, I would still get that same common denominator on the left. Is everybody okay with that? That's the trick here. So here we're going to have 4x is going to equal a times x plus 1 plus b times x minus 1 times x plus 1 plus c times x minus 1 squared. John? Just about our denominator. The x minus 1 to the first? So if I make a common denominator here, I would still end up with this, right? Because I multiply this by x minus 1 over x minus 1 and x plus 1 over x plus 1. I multiply this one by x plus 1, this one by x minus 1 squared, and it's still going to give me that same common denominator, right? So this is the trick with the repeated factor, is you need to have all of the exponents that are less than or equal to that repeated factor. So if that was x minus 1 cubed, you need x minus 1 cubed, x minus 1 squared, and x minus 1 to the first. Any repeated factor you're going to have to do that for. Does that? Yeah, it makes sense. Okay. It's, it's tough to, I mean, here's the thing. It's tough to remember, right? It's just tough to remember. The setup is all the same, though. It's all the same. Um, the tricky one is if you have nonlinear factors, I don't think we're going to bother with that. So 
So now we'll um, set up our system. So I have um, x squared first. So I have 0a plus 1b plus 1c has to equal 0. Then I'll do my linear. So I have 1a plus 0b minus 2c has to equal 4. And then my constants, so I have 1a plus negative 1b plus 1c have to also equal 0. Is everybody okay there? Okay. Set up my system. At least we have the calculator to do this, right? Back in my day, when I was learned how to do this, you had to do all this solving system, the solving system part all by hand, which was like super fun. Usually the systems were all very easy, but it was still like kind of annoying, especially if you get like a four or five equation system having to do by hand. Even if they're super easy, not a lot of fun. So here we have a is 2, b is 1, and c is negative 1. I read that wrong. Oh, no, I didn't. Okay, good. All right. So. Oh, boy. What did I just do here? I'm doing something real bad. I'll just keep going over here. So we have the integral then of x plus 1 plus 2 over x minus 1 squared plus 1 over x minus 1 plus negative 1 over x plus 1 dx. That was the x plus 1 that we said we were going to forget about for a minute. Oh, okay. And then we'd come back to. So that was just the forgotten, forgotten about x plus 1. Okay, so I have x squared over 2 plus x. How do I do the antiderivative of 2 over x minus 1 squared? So this would have just been 2 over u, right? Which is x minus 1. Yeah. Well, it's here. So 2u to the negative 2 du. You add one, right? Can you do that? Heck yeah, you can. Oh, okay. Absolutely. Is it, when, would you, when would you use an actual one? Uh, if it's to the first. Okay. So this next one, absolutely, we're going to end up with natural log x minus 1, and the next one, natural log x plus 1. Yeah, yeah, for both those last two, yes. Technically, u subs, but since they're like leading coefficient one degree one, like there's like nothing to do. Yeah, yeah, it's like the easiest u sub you've ever u subbed.
So yes, I did them in my head, 100%. All right, that feels good for this section. I don't want to get too much further into the weeds here. Um, let's look at these problems and come up, cook up a couple that are uh, reasonable to do since I had a bunch more in here that I was thought about but I don't think are worth doing. Um, that's okay. One is fine. I don't want to do three. We did integrate it. Annotate? Oh, annotate. Okay, sorry. My Mind your own business, Kulik. Yeah, I'm sorry. Okay. Okay. Well, this one I definitely know I don't want to do those. Yeah, we're not doing those. Go that just to 19. Guess I don't want that one in there. And that's not worth doing. Okay. That looks good. One and then seven through 19. Odd. Is that too many still? No. No, that's okay. If it feels like it's too many, we can make we can do less. Like it's not that big of a deal. You know? But I think that's okay. Shouldn't be too terribly time consuming. I'm trying to be especially on these extra ones that we're doing, being cautious with how much I'm asking you to do. You know, and this can be kind of time consuming. At least the partial fraction decomposition part. The integration part is pretty easy. But those parts, not so much. Um, feels like a good place to stop. Do you want to do any from the homework, or do you think we're okay? Okay. Okay. Cool.